Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. Um, unlike most of the other people speaking here today on the other days, um, I don't have own data to present. So what I'll be doing is quoting data from other people and connecting it to ideas, concepts, and, well, have come up in my practical work in the past 10 years. I would like to start with a quote by Ramdas, who um, has a lot of good things to say, especially around those topics of death and dying, in my opinion. And he says, the way we regard death is critical to the way we experience life. When your fear of death changes, the way you live your life changes. So I've structured my talk into a few sections, the one being the introduction that I've titled Not the End of the World, when death is part of your job description. Psychedelic experience, death and dying, a phenomenological comparison. End of life anxiety and depression, relevant studies in psychedelic science, we've heard about a few already, I'm just gonna come back to that. And then I want to focus in on the concept of self-transcendence as a key concept and then draw some conclusions. But first, I would like to start something we haven't had here yet, poetry. So those are only the first few lines from a, po a, po a poem from Juan Ramón Jiménez, which is called The Final Journal, Journey. And I think it's very fitting. And I will go away. And the birds will stay singing. And my garden will stay with its green tree and the wide water well. I have been working in hospitals, clinical medicine, for over 10 years. And I've done so in several different disciplines, mainly surgical, but also anesthesia, intensive care, and emergency medicine. And that's one of the reasons why my approach to death is perhaps a far more practical than for most of you. It's simply something I yeah, encounter sometimes on a daily basis. In those past three, three and a half weeks, I have been involved in 14 cases of death, signed 14 death certificates. That's a lot even for my standards, and things have ranged in this time from an old lady dying in the nursing home over a guy having a terrible motorbike accident and not being able to resuscitate him to a 26-year-old hanging in the hallway of his flat chair and his whole flat mates finding him there. And the interesting thing when you work with these topics is that you suddenly realize that even though personal death extinction is the end of your universe, it doesn't mean that at all for the rest of the world. Things will just go on once we snuff out. We will be missed for a while, but hey, that's the way things are, and that puts stuff into an interesting perspective, at least to myself. When you witness as many existential experiences as I have, I have been directly involved in about 100 birth processes as an anesthesiologist. I have signed over 160 death certificates in the past 10 years. Um, you get quite a good feeling of what good death could be and what bad death could be, or difficult death. And there are two stories I would really like to tell you, I already told them in my workshop, but for me, the classic example of a death not worth dying was an old man who was at home, in his 90s, frail, and then, well, he started dying, it's a process. And hey, people, it's normal. People die, old people die, that's what they do. And his family basically freaked out, I called an ambulance, and unfortunately, this guy ended up being dragged to a hospital where he died on a cold stretcher, under a thin blanket, full lights on, surrounded by 10 people who didn't even know his name, didn't know anything about him. And to me, this is a terrible way of dying. His family would have had the chance to tuck him in, hold him, and just guide him on his way out. And because they were, as most people in our society, incompetent with dealing with this process, they basically left him alone. And it doesn't have to be like that at all. In our culture, we have the problem that people are not used to dealing with death anymore. It has been outsourced to the professionals. So people go to 
hospices, go to hospitals, and most families don't have this classic example of granny dying at home that teaches everybody about what this is supposed to be like. But even in hospital work today, we can make this possible if we just try. We just have to take this bit of extra effort to make it possible. For example, I had an elderly gentleman who had the misfortune of being killed by his chemotherapy. They tried to heal him from his cancer and basically his immune system just went bust under the chemotherapy and he went totally septic and he ended up on my intensive care ward. And it became clear there was nothing to do, no way to save this person. And then I spoke to him and I said, listen, I'm very sorry to tell you, but you're not going to survive this night. You are dying, and you're dying now. Do you want me to call your wife? And there was this flicker of smile on his face. There was no talking at this stage. Then I called his wife and said, listen, make sure you get here safely, but you should come now. He is dying. And they were sitting there, her by his bed, and he just kind of rolled over to her side and looked at her. There was this immense trust between these two people. And they did this together, and he died peacefully in her arms. And when he was fading out, she said to me, I don't get it, he's always been such a fighter. And I said, yeah, but he's not fighting now. And she was at peace with it. And this didn't cost me more than an hour of my time, but for them, it was a life-changing situation, I guess. One challenge you face as a doctor, as a health professional of any kind, when you're kind of faced with this number of casualties, is not to harden up, to retain a sense of uniqueness and commitment to each of these people as a person. The same as a psychiatrist with patients, I suppose. If you see so many people in a difficult situations, that's really, really a difficult thing to do, but it's worth trying. And don't you run. Only if you are standing there as a mortal being in the presence of death with somebody dying, you can be the real witness, and that's what people need. And that's very close to trip sitting, that's very close to guiding a psychedelic session, being there in the moment, being present with your full being, not running away from whatever is happening, and just witnessing. And that's something I really learned through my psychedelic experiences, and which I'm very, very grateful for. And if some things are easier to explain with the peanuts. So I think this is very true. Someday we will all die, Snoopy. True. But all the other days we won't. And I think that's a perspective that's great to retain when you're dealing with these things. Because, hey, we have to live our life in the face of death and live it. This connection I'm trying to make today between psychedelics, death and dying is not my idea. This has been around forever. Everybody who's getting serious about this topic has at some point written something about it. Because if you have a deep psychedelic experience, you are going to be confronted with existential questions and death is one of the big ones there. So here you've got um, Stan Groff, you've got Randas, you've got Tim Sidiri even, and these things have been hand in hand forever. So, what I tried to do was um, to do a phenomenological comparison between the two. So, try to take the most relevant element, elements and the next step try to connect it to uh, mental health problems these days being treated or attempted to treat with psychedelics. So, the most relevant elements to me are things like loss of control versus surrender, something people who work with, with psychedelics know, know very well. You can either try to resist something that's happening or you can try to surrender and usually when you surrender you have an easier time. And that's what you see with people who are dying, those who have never learned to surrender to a process and they fight really hard, are really going to have a far harder time dying. Dissolving space and time, I'm not going to talk much about that because Mark Whitman did all the talking about this this morning. There's the two roads of ego dissolution after Dietrich, the so one being this element of oceanic boundlessness, being one with the cosmos, being in the one, and the fearful ego dissolution that comes with the sense of losing yourself, being destroyed, being eaten up by the void. And I think those, especially this being eaten up and being lost is something many people fear when they imagine the death and dying process, but I actually have not seen it that much in people who are actually dying. It doesn't seem to be that present when it's really happening. 
And then there's it's this element of self-transcendence, this being bigger than yourself, beyond yourself, finding meaning beyond yourself, the thing that some people call mystical. So, mental health issues currently investigated for psychedelic therapy are, for example, major depression, end-of-life anxiety, PTSD, addiction, now anorexia as well, and to a certain extent, because it's MDMA, social phobia and autism. I looked at this list and thought, they all have to do with essential questions of how you are in the world, how you want to live your life. End of life anxiety is like the obvious one there, but major depression, does this make any sense? PTSD, can I trust myself, can I trust the world? Addiction, turning towards patterns that keep you away from confronting all those questions. And anorexia, this very practical, starving yourself out of existence. So I would like to look into those studies now who worked with end-of-life anxiety and depression since the year 2000. Those are the four studies that have been conducted that were randomized controlled studies. We have heard about all of them at some point during this conference, interestingly enough, so I will not dive into them um, at great length, just kind of dip into it a bit. So there have been three with psilocybin, one with LSD, most of them um, had, um, well, half of them had a low dose substance as active placebo, the other one had niacin to kind of elicit some physical reaction. And all but one had integrative psychotherapy se uh, sessions before and after. So this is what we have as evidence up until now. In this area, there have been studies in the 60s, especially with LSD, but I'm not mentioning them here. Okay, sorry for that text line over there, but that's the study that uh, Warren Griffiths and Matt Johnson uh, did in, uh, at Johns Hopkins. So psilocybin produces substantial and sustained decreases in depression and anxiety in patients with life-threatening cancer. And they were the ones who had the largest sample, 51. And we have been hearing from Matt about it, so I'm not going to go into it uh, deeply, just for those who weren't there yesterday. So high doses of psilocybin versus low doses of psilocybin as active placebo, too long integration and preparation sessions. And I'm just going to focus in a bit on the questionnaires they use. So the old states of consciousness, the ASC questionnaire, hallucinogenic state questionnaire, several ones for anxiety, depression, quality of life, and the uh, validated mystical experience scale, which is the MEQ30. You've seen those results before. The relevant thing is after receiving the hyaluronidin, either first or after the, the low dose, people severely drop in depression and anxiety scores. And the interesting thing is that this up here is actually um, trait anxiety. It's so not just anxiety in the moment, but anxiety as a personality trait. That decreases. That's really interesting. And people don't qualify for diagnosis as either depressed or uh, as anxiety disorder anymore after receiving that treatment. And that lasts for up to six months. So the patients they had were cancer patients. These people were still sick. They still had their tumor. But they were living without fear, and they were less depressed. That's life quality, even if you're sick. And now if we move on, I would like to read out an account of one of the patients from that study. I found that in the New York Times, actually. Rima took the psilocybin at about 9 a.m., and its effects lasted till, until about 4 p.m. That night at home, she slept better than she had in a long time. The darkness finally stopped scaring her, and she was willing to go under, not because she knew she would come back, but because under was not as frightening. Why she was less afraid to die is hard for her to explain. Now I have the distinct sense that there's so much more, she says. So many different states of being. I have the sense that death is not the end, but just part of a process and a way of moving into a different sphere, a different way of being. Moving from this very moving report to a bit of um, the psychometry that has been done. So the MEQ30 being quoted by so many people and it's being said so often that mystic experience is like the key variable for change. I'm just wondering, and I, I like being the devil's advocate, be sorry, I'm sorry for that, but it, it's just this way I am. I'm wondering, okay, it's a validated scale, but do we really measure what we say we are measuring? So I looked at those questions in MEQ30, and the first 15 questions are about the mystical dimensions 
like pure being, all is one, reverence, unity. In the next 15 are more about positive moods, time and space effects, and the ineffability, so things can't be put into words. So half of the things are actually more to do, in my opinion, with the depths of the psychedelic or immersive experience, and the other half is like about mysticism. And if that's the case, um, I'm wondering, is it not putting a tall order on patients if we say, oh, you have to have, or your, your chances of getting better are so much better if you're going to have a mystical experience now? Or is it not just strong experience? Do we really need that notion of mystical? It kind of roots back in traditions like, like Walter Stays and William James and so on that come from a Christian background as well. And I'm, I would be very happy if we would not use this so much as something we impose on people. So the intensity, and, and uh, interestingly enough, Matthias Lichti said that they correlated the MEQ30 with the Dietrich scales on a, the ASC, and they saw that the oceanic boundlessness matched best with the, the mysticism. And this tells the tale, in my opinion. So it's the intensity of the immersiveness, the going beyond yourself. But let's have a look if it really needs to be going somewhere from just out of yourself. So do we need mysticism to understand deep psychedelic experience? I would say... In our modern world today, no. We just have to find good terms for, well, defining what we mean better. And one concept in this that I find pretty impressive is this notion of self-transcendence as promoted by Viktor Frankl. Who of you knows Viktor Frankl? Okay, great. For those who don't, just one sentence. He was an Austrian psychiatrist who did not survive one but three concentration camps. And he came out sane. And he kind of reverse engineered why he had been resilient and survived into a mode of psychotherapy. And that's very impressive and his ideas are great. Um, so what he's basically saying is the essentially self-transcendent quality of human existence renders man a being reaching out beyond himself. And I think that's very, very... To me this sounds very plausible when I think about the psychedelic experience. So there's three levels he's describing. One being seeking situational meaning. I'll explain it in a while, just go through it first. Seeking one's calling and seeking ultimate meaning. So situational meaning is something that goes very well with also third wave behavioral therapy theories like mindfulness in the present moment, an attitude of openness, curiosity and compassion. And interestingly enough, letting go of self-interest and social conditioning. The second level is seeking one's calling, reaching beyond self-actualization. So a will to meaning, trying to find a purpose that lies beyond yourself, and a societal contribution beyond your personal happiness and success. The third level, which he calls ultimate meaning, is reaching towards the transcendental. So for religious people, towards the super being, towards God. Or for us, or for them, those who ever, who are not religiously in the classical sense. It is this idea of the ultimate ideals of goodness, beauty, and the mysterious comes in there as well, the ineffable. So if we look at patients, and if we look at what makes them better when they work with these substances, is it really necessary to have a transcendent experience in the sense of meeting God or whatever out there, having a mystic experience, or is the self-transcendence going beyond yourself, so level two in Frankl's hierarchy, not level three, not very often enough? Is it not really something we could perhaps work with more, this aspect of not being limited to yourself, but going beyond your own capacities, instead of trying to get somewhere with that? So I would just put this notion to you. I think it's worth thinking about. Right, I'm already at my conclusions. We as humans need to confront essential questions and seek meaning. Because if we don't, we get sick. That's part of our mental health crisis today that people don't do that. Psychedelics can help develop these skills and reduce fear because they confront us with these existential processes very often if we let them. Mental health issues currently treated with psychedelics are intrinsically linked to essential questions. And that's why they're treatable with psychedelics, in my opinion. Psychedelic science can help promote a societal change towards a more conscious approach to death and dying. And that will not only benefit those who use the substances, but our whole society. 
I would like to finish again with Ramdas. We are all just walking each other home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. We have time for three questions. Um, I was wondering if there's, because uh, this research is done, I think, in the hospital setting. Um, is there any research that's done in the um, at-home setting, uh, more from like the, the family physician side of, uh, uh, of things? And if there's a, a difference in the impact that is possible in the, in the home setting compared to the, to the hospital? Well, the study that Peter Gasser has done as a preliminary study in Switzerland and also is doing now is done in his practice. So not a hospital setting, but like a doctor's practice. I think the home setting puts very many like regulatory difficulties and that's why I think it has not been attempted yet. Yeah, you're not making it explicit, but um I mean, between the lines, it's very obvious that you're saying that the use of psychedelics um, should be should take place without uh, outside of clinical settings as well, because it's beneficial to um, people even if they don't suffer from terminal illness. Is that right? I believe that next to psychedelic therapy psychedelic self-experience as a measure of developing your own consciousness should be investigated. I think it's far more difficult to get the regulatory authorities to approve that, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't attempt to. Uh, hey, thank you for your talk. Um, yeah, you asked the question if we need a direction in the psychedelic experience. And I was, think, I was thinking about uh, could a uh, genuine interest in truth be such a direction? What do you think about it? Well, I think if we look back to Thomas Metzinger's talk and the emphasis is put on intellectual honesty, I think that should be underlying any kind of experience and what is true there, like for our everyday consciousness is even more true when it comes to all the states of consciousness. I want to clarify one last thing. When I did this talk before, I was told, oh, so you're denying the mystic experience. And I was like, well, that sounds to me like trying to deny Wednesdays. It's, <laughs> it's nothing to deny or endorse. It's something that is there, but we just have to see what we mean and how we work with it. Thank you. Well, since we had very short questions, we can extend and have two more. Please. I understand that psychedelic experience with its self-transcendence and getting rid of control can be a good practice for dying. But what about actual psychedelic assisted dying? There are two parts to that answer. The first, or well, three parts, actually. So this is the longer answer you wanted. Um, the first thing is, yes, there are descriptions of people doing that, the most famous being Aldous Huxley, being injected LSD by his wife, and apparently he had a very peaceful death. But then again, Aldous Huxley was a very experienced psychonaut. I would not want to impose, or even think about imposing first psychedelic experiences to people in a very intense process like that, because the mistake you make there, you can't turn well anymore. The third thing is, from a scientific point of view, I believe there's no way in hell you're going to get ethics for this, at this time. <laughs> That's my answer. Thank you. So, um, from the first wave, it was really clear that they look into the East, in the Book of the Dead and the Tibetan and everything. And it seems funny that society really catch up and yoga and, and the counterculture become culture. But the science that they first brought it in, it never caught up. Why do you think we never got into the holistic perspective of the East in science? 
I would not advocate for cultural transplants into science. I actually believe that, you know, I've got this inner picture of science providing like the psychedelic petri dish and watch what is growing in it and not trying to superimpose stuff. And as it has been said before in that panel, we should work with what people bring in, but we don't, should, shouldn't bring stuff in from the outside. We should not be imposing any concepts on people.